Before the Jewish communities of Rhodes and Kos ultimate deportation in July of 1944, Rhodes Lee Jews enjoyed a rich and textured history on the island. Translated as the Island of Roses, Rhodes was home to Jews since the Roman Empire when they settled there after the fall of the Second Temple. By the 16th century, the Jewish community in Rhodes was thriving and later in the century, Kahal Shalom was constructed. Kahal Shalom remains the oldest standing synagogue in Greece. Rhodes Lee Jews enjoyed relative autonomy, continuing to speak Judeo-Spanish and practicing their unique customs on the Turkish-controlled island. After Italy conquered the island from the Ottomans in 1912, just before World War I, the Jews of Rhodes learned Italian. Indeed, it was not uncommon for a Rhodes Lee Jew to speak five to six languages. But by 1938, as Italy allied with Germany, new anti-Jewish laws forced the school's closure and a dramatic change to the island's residents. The Nazis occupied Rhodes in 1943, further restricting movement of the Jewish community and terrorizing them. By July 18th of 1944, plans were made for the final deportation of the Jewish residents of Rhodes to Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen. When they arrived at Auschwitz in the middle of August, 600 youths were selected for hard labor. The remaining Jewish residents of Rhodes and Kos were killed. Fewer than 200 of those 600 survived the camps. The descendants of the Rhodes Lee community, both survivors and those who immigrated from Rhodes before 1938, scattered throughout the Jewish diaspora. But a substantial number ended up in Seattle, Washington. Congregation Ezra Baserath is home to the Seattle descendants of the remaining Rhodes Lee community. In 2010, Ezra Becerra's centennial anniversary, congregants Harley and Leela Franco decided to donate a beautification of the courtyard as a gift to the community. I was having a conversation with Harley and Leela Franco about their desire to finish the what became known as the Franco Courtyard, and they showed me a, a notebook of pictures of something that they were they were seeking my opinion about. Uh, erecting something in the courtyard that reflected from the history of Rhodes. And there's a, uh, uh, the stand had been built for it, and it was a uh, fountain that was uh, uh, reflective of a fountain, copying a fountain that exists in the Isle of Rhodes, uh, in the Jewish section. But it's uh, seahorses with, with water coming out of their mouths and um, I reacted a little bit negatively to it. And I think they were surprised by that because they thought that was a pretty cool idea. And uh, I said, you know, it's a beautiful fountain and it's nice that it would reflect something that's an iconic image of Rhodes. Like the Space Needle is an iconic image of Seattle, but it has nothing to do with Jews. I wish that you would put something up in the courtyard that reflects the Jewish history of Rhodes. And that's how we got onto the subject of, of this monument. Well, it's, it's very moving. Being uh, on the Isle of Rhodes, seeing the original monument, it has six sides. And the six sides are in six languages with the same message. All six of those languages were commonly spoken on the Olive Roads. One of them is Ladino, Greek, French, English. And, um, and then it sits on a six-pointed star, which is obviously the Star of David. But the six sides and the six points, each one represents one million of the six million casualties, martyrs, uh, of the Nazis in World War II. Over the years, the community has seen testimonials from Sephardic survivors. The community has listened to lectures from illustrious rabbis like Rabbi Mark Angel and Israel Chief Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau, a survivor himself. Rabbi Lau was here to be our keynote speaker. 
and he gave an address uh, in the main sanctuary. And then um, we were going to come out here and do our usual memorial prayer at the monument. But since Rabbi Lau hadn't seen it, the Master of Ceremonies asked Harley and I to escort Rabbi Lau out here in privacy for a few moments before the crowd joined us. So I was able to take the opportunity with just the three of us standing at the monument to explain to Rabbi Lau the history of it, what its significance was, what its meaning was. And he was so moved that he went over, put his hand on it, and kissed his hand as if it was a mezuzah. And he turned to me and he said three words in Hebrew. Ze makom kadosh. This is a holy place. And I had tears in my eyes for the rest of the evening. A very moving moment from a Holocaust survivor rabbi. Additionally, the courtyard was a tour stop for a United States Holocaust Memorial Museum conference. Sephardic Jews and the Holocaust, held in Seattle in 2013 and co-sponsored by the University of Washington's Sephardic Studies Program. Professor Devin Narr helped facilitate the cooperative conference. Stanford professor Aaron Rodrigue was the keynote speaker of the event, speaking about the collective memory of roads before the war. The forces that were behind the Holocaust, the forces of anti-Semitism, of racism, of racial purity, of Aryan superiority, of white supremacy, these are forces that both during the Second World War and since in different iterations in different parts of the world have continued to target and jeopardize the safety and well-being not only of Jews, but also of other marginalized uh, populations. I think we have a particular responsibility to be aware and to act, not only in uh, interest of self-defense, but also in extending our hands to those other communities in our nation um, who are the objects and the targets of some of the same forces that have had detrimental and devastating impact on our own communities. I think we can recognize that our own safety, our own well-being, our own prospects of freedom and liberation are bound up with those of our neighbors.